Good afternoon. My name is Gary Sealing, and I work for Element 84 as a software developer doing a lot of work with AWS. And today I have the pleasure of introducing our CTO, Dan Pallone. Element 84 has a long history of working with geospatial data on projects where our work tries to benefit the world. And geospatial data presents a lot of interesting technical challenges due to the data volume of the raw imagery sent from satellites. In this talk, Dan's going to talk about working with uh, the AWS Snowball Edge to provide maps in disaster response scenarios. Many thanks to him and all the attendees for their for flexi being flexible about our conference moving online. And just like the other talks, we'll be collecting questions through Slack, and I will moderate those and give those to Dan at the end. Thanks. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Gary. Uh, so I am Dan Pallone. Um, and we're going to be talking about bridging between geospatial data and disaster response organizations, and in particular, kind of how the cloud fits into this. Uh, a couple quick disclaimers. Uh, I am assuming uh, some familiarity or a decent familiarity with AWS. Um, I am happy to answer questions afterwards. And when I talk about the cloud, I am basically referring to AWS. Everything I talk about here deploys into AWS. Uh, some of the principles are not unique to it. Uh, but the general, but everything we've done as far as this is, in, is related to, uh, to deploying into AWS. So, all right, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump right into it. And I'm going to start by kind of setting the context for this talk. So, uh, on November 8th, um, 7 a.m., Butte County Search and Rescue pager goes off. The owner of that pager was in a conference call. When he finished that conference call about an hour later, 8 a.m., he turned on his radio and heard that the fire was everywhere. What I'm talking about is a California campfire. Uh, this was in 2018, end of 2018. And the individual I'm talking about is Trevor Skaggs. That's him in yellow uh, in the picture there with the, the pretty awesome beard. He is a volunteer with Butte County Search and Rescue and North Valley uh, Animal Disaster Group. And he was a first responder on November 8th. So for some context for this, uh, Element 84, we work with a lot of geospatial data. So we support NASA, NOAA, USGS. Uh, making their data available and accessible. And what we were doing at the time was we were working on a user need study for disaster response. And we ended up getting connected to Trevor to talk about the Butte County Search and Rescue and kind of how uh, the geospatial data, how remote sensing data could apply to disaster response scenarios and how we could make it accessible for them. The conversations we had with him ended up fundamentally changing a ton of our assumptions uh, and it really forced us to step back and kind of rethink how we come at this problem. So to give you an idea of the campfire, though, if you're not familiar, on seven, at 723, a text came out from Butte County Sheriff saying there's an evacuation order for the town of Polga. The town of Polga is up there, and the, if you're on your screen, the upper right-hand corner there with a the red around it, uh, that was at 723. And then about 40 minutes later at 8 o'clock, an updated evacuation quarter, order comes out for Paradise East all the way over to Highway 70. So now you're pushing into Kincow. 840, so about 20 minutes after that, an updated evacuation order comes out. You're now looking at zones 2, 6, 7, and 13. By 1030 that morning, another update comes out, this time pushing out to Centerville and Butte Creek. And then at 1 o'clock that afternoon, uh, CAL FIRE puts out a tweet about the campfire. 8,000 acres have burned, it's 0% con con contained, and evacuation orders are in place for Paradise, Magalia, Concow, Butte, Can Can Butte Creek Canyon, and Butte Valley. So to give you some context of what I'm talking about, right? That's the footprint of Washington, DC. So in the first five to six hours from when this started until one o'clock that afternoon, an area about twice the size of Washington, D.C. had burned to the ground or was about to. This is the scale of the fire that we're talking about and the pace at which it moved. At one point, this fire hits 35 miles an hour. So if you can imagine looking out of your window at a car going by at 35 miles an hour, that's how fast a wall of flame is racing by as this fire is moving around. By numbers, in the first three hours, 5,000 acres burn. In the first 24 hours, 70,000 acres have burned to the ground. By the end of the first day, you have almost 2,300 response personnel on scene. So this, these aren't the people that are being evacuated. These are people coming into health, right? 2,300 people on scene by the end of the first 24 hours. And at 9 p.m., you've got GIS and mapping efforts underway. Trevor's day job 
involves geospatial, uh, working with geospatial data. And so he's sitting there as part of this, writing Python scripts, fetching data to try to get some visibility, some situational awareness on what's going on. This is not a stock photo. This is actually a photo from him that he let us use. Uh, this was taken in the middle of the afternoon. So one o'clock, it is basically pitch black from the smoke and everything's on fire. So what that, those first 24 hours, right? What's that look like? You've got teams trying to contain the fire. You have evacuation of people and animals. You have traffic management going on. You have search and rescue operations and you have public communication, right? Cause you have to inform everybody where they need to go, when to get out, who needs to be moving. All of this is going on in those first 24 hours. Our conversation with him, he just kept driving home kind of one key point. And that key point is that knowledge is key. It's not about just getting data in front of people. It's not even about just getting information in front of people. You've got to get actionable knowledge into people's heads to, to let them be able to actually make decisions based on the data being made available. We talked about, you know, he would say, don't give me uh, solutions where I can change color layers or the color palette used to render some piece of data or let me mess with projections. I don't need that. What I need is a big red area that says the fire is here. And then another thing that says the fire is probably going over here and we need to begin preparing for that. Like that, abstracting this up to knowledge was the critical piece. So if we look at what's happening for this individual to kind of give you a sense of what's going on, right? So you've got first responder search and rescue duties. Those are happening. He's being deployed, he's going out to get this stuff. You're building an incident action plan. You're building a missing persons list for start, start search and rescue coordination. You've got pet and animal rescue after that. Once that's done, you're now beginning to do pet and animal rescue. And this isn't necessarily dogs and cats, although <laughs> he talked about at the end, they had one fish left. But uh, that they had that they couldn't find the owner for, but everything else was taken care of. But you're talking about horses and cattle and goats, like not insignificant animals that are trying to be moved and relocated. Um, you have impromptu routing for search and rescue. You're building a GIS and mapping system on the fly. He's throwing together Python to make this work. And in the meantime, he's trying to train and communicate this information to the people around him. And that's really the key piece here is that when he's having these conversations, he's talking to people who in the back of their mind are thinking about whether or not everything they owned has just burned to the ground and is their family safe. So this leads to the second point that he drilled with us. And this is the one that fundamentally just made us rethink everything is you get 15 minutes. You've got 15 minutes to work with an individual to get them the knowledge they need to be able to interpret whatever they're looking at to be able to use the tool you're showing them or to be able to make the decisions they need to make to then move forward. He put this framework around us of like, if it's gonna take me more than 15 minutes, I can't use it. So that really made us step back and say, okay, we gotta, we gotta regroup. So when we think about what are we doing with geospatial data and how do we make it available to disaster, to, in disaster response and to first responders and their support teams, how do we think about this? How do we, how do we organize this? So, First thing we did was we started talking about what if we think about the types of data that we use. So we can think about it, we can kind of bin them this way. We can say, all right, we have high volume, highly processed data. So in this case, sorry, same acronym, but search, in, uh, this is um, synthetic aperture radar, right? So SAR, synthetic aperture radar. Synthetic aperture radar is voluminous data. It's, it's very high volume data. Uh, it can be very difficult to work with. It's computationally intensive. Typically what you do is you'll get multiple uh, scenes. Um, you will then basically look for phase interference and create what are called interferograms. And that tells you kind of the displacement that actually happens. It's computationally in intensive, it's storage intensive, they're, they're large volume uh, data. And it is, uh, if you're not used to looking at an interferogram or understand how to use them, they can be very difficult to use. Kind of the next tier, we have this intermediate processing, low latency data. So uh, NASA Lance is an example of that. That's typically 30 minute delayed data coming off of NASA instruments um, designed for first and rescue emergency response. Um, and um, the, uh, it's not science quality data, but that's okay. Like, we need it for the rapid response, so we can go there. And then we have low volume uh, in situ data, right? But this is highly time sensitive data. So we're talking about drone data, human intelligence, um, information on the ground. So I'm gonna tell you now, ultimately, this was a bad idea. And we ended up kind of getting here, really that last one should kind of be the clue, right? This idea that it's highly time sensitive data, and if it's not used quickly, it loses its value. Implicit in that is a, it loses its value to whom, right? 
if you're a first responder and I come back to you and say, hey, I have data from where the fire was last week. You're like, okay, great. That's not really helping me. Um, but, you know, kind of the flip side of this is if you're a researcher and you're looking at trends of forest fires over 40 years, a single drone flight really isn't terribly helpful. You need more consistent data. This data may not have been helpful from the beginning. So this isn't rocket science, um, but the, the user, the intended use is absolutely vital to kind of the understanding of this entire problem. So we shifted gears and we said, all right, let's start talking about our users. Who are our users? And if you're familiar with um, uh, user personas, right, that's what I'm talking about, or user classes, you know, kind of whatever terminology you want to use. But if we start thinking about who are our users and we start looking at, okay, we have responders, we have support teams for those responders, we have application builders, we have decision and policy makers. Each of those, if you treat those as a persona, begin looking at the data differently and looking at the user needs differently. And if you take those and you kind of just do this as just an example, uh, grid here, example matrix, but if we start looking at what are different people doing with this data, we start coming up with a bunch of different answers, none of which are wrong, right? There, it's the right answer for that user, for that need, for that environment. So if they're doing MapReduce anal map style analysis, they're looking at Hadoop, or you're looking at uh, Dask and X-Array with Pangeo, uh, Cassandra, you're doing that style of processing. If you're a GIS user, you're looking at QGIS or ArcGIS, or you're maybe even running GDAL directly or Boodle directly against the data, something like that. Machine learning, now we're talking scikit-learn, SageMaker, uh, TensorFlow, um, how your data is staged and available for, train for, for model development is critical. Each of these brings with it a set of use cases, and, and not just use cases, it, it's um, it really kind of these fundamental assumptions that are baked into how I can get to the data and what I wanna do with that data. And so, it really boils to this boils down to this thing, you know, this idea of different end users require different access patterns and different service needs. Like this, again, this is not rocket science. I don't pretend that this is rocket science, but this is really what we ended up having to step back and rethink everything we were doing with respect to taking geospatial data out to disaster response. We had to really look at it from the eyes of, okay, that's our target audience. And there's a bunch of other kind of just biased knowledge that we're bringing in from other users that just doesn't apply or in some cases is 100% wrong. So we think about it this way and we say, all right, what does that look like? So this is a screenshot of roughly where we ended up. Um, and I'm going to kind of dive deep into kind of what makes all of this tick behind the scenes and how this works. Simple user interface, simple toggle switches. The imagery you're actually looking at here is of the campfire. Um, this is from Maxar. This is SWIR imagery, so short wave infrared. Um, if you look closely, you can actually see individual houses burning in the development there. Um, this is highly processed data, and it is critical to provide the kind of in insight and uh, visibility into what's going on. All right, so we have this idea. Uh, we know who our users are. So then we ask the question of, all right, how do we make day one easier? Well, we want to get easy access to remote sensing data. That's the whole reason we started this problem. And, and, in talking with the users in this user needs workshop uh, and, and the whole effort of putting that user needs paper together, that's a, it's available on our website. Um, I don't have a direct link to it, but you can download it. Um, but in the course of putting that together, what we ended up with is this whole idea of, um, sorry. We end up with this whole idea of, um, how do we get this data out there? Remote sensing data, how do we make it available? We know what they want, we know that they need it. We need a basic map foundation, that was a given. We have to get this stuff onto a map, a simple interface. And then we need the flexibility to add disparate data sources to that map. De depending on the actual event that we're responding to, there are different needs. Even for the same product, we may wanna process it differently and make it available. The integration and tooling piece, right? So this is the idea, this is from, you know, talking about earlier, depending on what the user's trying to do, they have a set of tools that they want to use. We can't just rebuild the whole world around them. So what kind of tooling do they expect to use? How do we make that available? And then we have to be fast. How do we get extremely rapid response capability? This leads to this idea of what we put together is a disaster response data pipeline. And it kind of goes like this. This is the conceptual idea behind the pipeline. There's some event trigger. Something's watching for this thing to happen. There's alerts from NOAA. There's a National Weather Service alerts. Forecast, you can actually do it off of models. So forecasting a hurricane model. If we know a hurricane is coming, something along those lines, we can say, all right, let's start. Let's get this whole thing moving. Um, Real-time response triggers. Uh, earthquake. So USGS has an earthquake feed that you can attach to and, and follow, uh, whether RSS or Twitter. 
Um, there's wildfires alerts, like I mentioned, the Cal, the Cal Fire uh, alerts coming out, um, and obviously a human can trigger this. So something triggers it, we kick it off. So now we get into actually gathering tools and data. So now we want to start pulling OpenStreetMap, Landsat, Maxar data. We want to take advantage of existing pieces. So like there's a uh, GeoInt has a data pack, which you can basically package up a set of data, a bunch of, uh, of information and move that over. Um, and then we need to potentially process that data as appropriate for the event type. So uh, depending on what's going on, if we want to do a fire boundary, if we want to look at fire response, or we want to look at um, in the event of say an earthquake, look at displacement, uh, depending on what we're trying to do, there's different types of processing we have to do for that particular event and get that going. We want to set the actual tools up, right? So what do they want to use, right? We can provision the services and the user interfaces. Film drop DR is the one I showed you earlier. If you're using map server, QGIS, get all those pieces together. We need to create a deployment for that and get all that stuff ready to go. We have static content we can put together and we can spin up these ephemeral services, right? So this is where now, okay, let's talk about how this thing actually works, right? Like, so no hand waving, let's, let's kind of, let's get under the covers of this. Here's a high level diagram of what this looks like in AWS. Okay, this is the disaster pipeline from, from left to right on your screen. All right, everything here, almost everything, the, the vast majority of the whole processing pipeline is serverless. And what that means is that when this is not actively in use, it will spin down to almost zero cost. When everything's idle, it basically spins down except for storage buckets and a couple other kind of housekeeping pieces that we need to keep going. But for the most part, this whole thing spins to nearly zero cost when we're not actively responding. So kind of starting from the left and working over, you have this monitoring for uh, an alert, right? This is, the, this is the event alert that I mentioned in the pipeline. So here, there's a whole bunch of adapters uh, connecting to a bunch of different potential data sources. So Twitter, um, you can be watching RSS feeds, obviously a human can poke this, but ultimately what happens is something triggers this thing in a way that this Lambda function wakes up and, and kind of kicks off the rest of it. Um, you could actually go so far as to consider something like sentiment analysis and pushing that out. Uh, we do not do that, but you could potentially you know, consider leveraging something to, like, to that extreme. All right, so now you get the, um, the events going off, and we've now kicked off the next stage of our processing. What happens here is first we'll create a database. We'll create we use DynamoDB, we'll spin up a little database. This is a little metadata database that begins stuffing everything we know about the actual event that's happening. We know the type of event, we most likely have the area of interest at this point, and we'll know the time of interest. We know when this whole thing started. We'll push all that up there. At the same time, this is where we start to go horizontal, uh, and we go real horizontal real fast. We can now start fetching data, the relevant data for the particular event type. We can begin fetching that at scale and processing it like we need to. So we'll create a set of storage buckets, S3 buckets, for this particular event, and then horizontally scale out all of the different data processing for the different data types that we want to get and begin populating these buckets and filling those buckets with relevant information. Those don't shut down or they don't need to shut down either. They can continue processing, they can continue running, basically keeping that bucket current with data as the instruments collect it, as Maxar makes more data available, as Planet makes data available, pick your, your source, but we'll continue to keep those buckets current and, and keep that information flowing. At the same time that's going on, we can begin provisioning the compute side of all of this. So for a given event type, we know the, the type of processing we want to know. We know the tools that they want to do, they want to use. And we'll begin packaging all of these things up uh, into AMIs, pre-configured for the event, staging all of that, making that available. And then lastly, we'll start producing the static metadata. We'll create another bucket, not just metadata, but the whole static application. We'll create another bucket, configure that for static web hosting, and begin populating that with all the static content that we need to be able to deliver at scale. We can punch that out, give it an externally accessible URL, and ideally, if the first responders still have web access, which in the case of the campfire, they did for a long time, um, they can get directly to that, but we can also do it at scale so we can begin providing information to the general public uh, around the area that's affected. Um, all of this is happening at scale and can be done in single digit minutes. So we can go from zero to a publicly accessible URL exposing all of this information own, not instantly, but really, really quickly and get this out. And even if the data processing is lagging behind and taking some time to catch up, the, the general information is being pushed out there, everybody has access to it. And as the data appears or the imagery appears, we can start surfacing it. So back to this application, back to this user interface, this is all static um, in terms of how we distribute it. It's a React application. 
Um, it's all served out of an S3 bucket. We can leverage CloudFront to actually edge cache it if we need to, to get the scalability. Um, but ultimately this all runs you know, client side and we can continue to refresh it with data, pushing this imagery out. So um, as part of kind of the tooling, if we're gonna deploy this and let people hit this, then we're standing up a, a tile server and we can do that at scale. We spin one of those up and we make that accessible and so on. Um, what you're seeing here, this is uh, NASA MODIS data coming off the MODIS instrument, which is flying on Aqua. It actually flies on two satellites, so we, it flies on Aqua and Terra, so we can get multiple passes and see it from different, uh, at different times of day. Uh, this is an example of OpenStreetMap data. Um, so this is, if you're familiar with Google Streets, if you're not familiar with OpenStreetMap, this is basically an open source um, street uh, mapping capability. Um, it's fantastic, and this data is all freely available and publicly available. And we're pulling that, it's tiled, we we'll pull that and we can make that available to, to end users as well. We can take the imagery or the information from our DynamoDB and create informational layers on top of it. So what you're seeing here, this is the footprint of the fire um, as of one o'clock uh, on, uh, on the day it started. And what we can do here, this is just a GeoJSON that, uh, feature that we're creating based on the metadata that we're collecting, we can surface it out to end users and push it out, and we can continue to update these as we get new information. In addition to, <coughs> excuse me, technical, tech to textual information that we're getting from users, we can surface that out as well. This is commercial imagery. Uh, this is an example of imagery coming from Maxar. This is over Chico. What you're seeing, those are not clouds. It's actually smoke coming off of the fire, but this is overlaid on top of OpenStreetMap but just an example of kind of just running through kind of just different types of data that can be surfaced. Um, and all of that takes minimal of any processing um, to surface and expose out. We can do it extremely quickly. So I'm gonna take a little bit of a tangent here and I wanna talk a little bit about some additional data sources, right? Because the idea here again is not just blasting information out, but how do we get, or blasting data out? How do we get it up to knowledge? How do we, how do we expose this as meaningful, actionable knowledge? So, one of the sources that I, I want to mention is Facebook data for good. So Facebook has access to over 2 billion Facebook users. And what they do is they will de-identify that data and they will expose that data or, or, or surface that data in different ways, depending on the event, um, but in response to disasters. They'll make this data available for disaster use. The way it works is if, you've use, if you use Facebook and you have location services on, Facebook knows where you are. And they also know general usage for a given population area. And so what they can do is actually look at the physical movement of Facebook users. And they can also look at it based on kind of population density, um, like are they seeing traffic um, increase or decrease over areas. So this is uh, a video, hopefully it'll, it'll look okay over Zoom here, but um, it'll, it'll loop. Um, this is the week following the California campfire. On the right-hand side, you see paradise, and on the, or the right-hand side of that circle is paradise, the left-hand side is Chico, and the color spectrum there, blue is a drop of 70% um, change uh, in terms of basically Facebook usage, and uh, red is 70% increase in the gradations in between. So what you can see pretty quickly is the mass migration of people out of paradise and into Chico as a result of this. This is the kind of information that you can see and we can surface as soon as you get this data available. And now we can start looking at, okay, where are people going? What's the next area that may need help? Or where do we have to get people out of that they're not able to leave? Another example of this, uh, Facebook worked with American Red Cross and NetHope uh, for Puerto Rico in response to Hurricane Maria. So this is uh, a NASA imagery, uh, this is a Veers uh, imagery. Uh, it's a nighttime product uh, passing over Puerto Rico, uh, July 2017. So you're looking at Puerto Rico and some of the surrounding islands, and uh, you can see the, the country lit up. Um, and so uh, this is a pass on October of the same year, and it is dark. So this is after Maria. Maria just wiped out the electric grid over Puerto Rico. So if I kind of flip back and forth, this is the same, same location. I'm looking, you're looking at roughly the same imagery, uh, and Puerto Rico goes dark. With the data from Facebook, what you could begin to see is where power was beginning to return or people were able to get connectivity back. And so American Red Cross and NetHope used that information to triage areas. Uh, the area that stays lit up there in the October one is uh, San, uh, San Juan. 
And um, the uh, so American Red Cross and NetHope were able to uh, prioritize where were they going to go, and you could begin to see parts of Puerto Rico coming back based on um, Facebook data showing population. Here's an example. This is the Australian wildfires from the end of last year. Um, this is again um, NASA modus, modus imagery, but you can actually see the smoke plumes coming off the coast. Here's a different view of this. So this is image. This is uh, information coming from. Uh, the Australian fire services. What you're seeing here are the actual fires of where these, how they were uh, carving up and segregating the different brush fires that were happening. And then in addition to that, they pushed out information related to what the situation was for any one of those, as well as where to go get more information. Making this kind of information available gives people what they need to be able to do to make decisions of do they need to be evacuated, do they need to be in place, how controlled is this. So this fire in particular, um, Clyde Wright Ridge, uh, is a, sorry, Clyde Ridge Road was under control. There's a link for more information. They tell you when it was last updated and they continue reporting this information out. This has continued to, to continue to go. Let's raise it up another level. So we can put out information but can we help people actually understand and process this information? So now let's talk a little bit about uh, applying machine learning to some of these things. There's a group called SpaceNet. Uh, it's a collaboration between Cosmic Works, Maxar, uh, AWS, Capella, Intel, um, IEEE is involved. There's a whole bunch of groups uh, in this one. And uh, what they do is they run a regular competition. And the, this competition is they have a corpus of data that they make available to you, um, high resolution imagery of a variety of different sensors, depending on the competition. But this data is open and available, freely available. Um, and they will have a problem that they'll set out and make that data available, make some tooling available to use that data, and then put out the prize um, for whoever has the best solution. Um, the prize sometimes on the order of thirty to fifty thousand dollars, depending on the problem. Um, there have been things around ship tracking or ship identification. The most recent one, I think it was Challenge Five, uh, was around automated road extraction and then calculating route travel time. So, here's two screenshots. Um, this is the kind of imagery they make available. They picked, uh, I think, four cities they made available. There's actually two lines. Hopefully, you can see it on your screen. Um, there's actually two lines there. There's a blue line and yellow line. The blue lines are basically the right answer for the routing problem. Um, the yellow lines are what the various models came up with. Um, but the idea is that given a high resolution satellite imagery, can you develop a model that will do road extraction? And then given the road extract, the extracted road information, which was actually part of challenge four, given the extracted road information, can you then do route planning across that? And can you do it correctly? So they made this data available for four cities. They saved a fifth city back for, um, for testing, basically for scoring the models. So these are screenshots from that one. Once everybody, uh, they submit the models, make, those, make that information available, um, SpaceNet will then go ahead, or the SpaceNet challenge goes ahead and actually scores those against a city that the models had not seen before. And then the right-hand image you can see is uh, basically off access. Um, which you can see the buildings are kind of tilted, which just makes for a whole other mess of problems uh, in there. And they look to see how the various models behaved um, when you didn't have, um, when you had an off axis imagery. So the application of this though is directly with disaster response. You've got a scenario where bridges are out, buildings have collapsed, roads are damaged, earthquakes have taken out something. Whatever those cases are, can we take advantage of the, the high volume of remote sensing imagery available, apply trained models to this, extract road information, and be able to do routing and efficient routing um, in situ, or, or be able to provide that information to get to evacuate or whatever, the, or even just to get in to do the response. All right, we're just kind of getting warmed up, right? So we've got this going on, all of these capabilities. We talked about how can we make day one easier, right? So that's the rapid response pieces and everything else. So let's talk about how do we make week one easier. We have a simple interface that can be learned in less than 15 minutes. We can answer that problem. We know we're good there. We can maintain current data for all the layers in the map. We can use the, the scalability of the cloud. We can use the elasticity of the cloud to process that scale, to process quickly, to spin this up, to make it accessible to the world if need be. So those pieces, okay, now what, right? It starts to beg the question, can we support offline capabilities in sync? And can we integrate in situ 
geospatial data. And by that, I mean like on the ground uh, geospatial data. And here's where normally kind of the inclination is to step outside of the cloud kind of a thing. And this was where um, we really wanted to kind of keep pushing on this. And I have to introduce this idea of the AWS Snowball Edge. If you're not familiar with this, so AWS introduced this in 2016 at reInvent. Prior to that, there was this idea of an AWS Snowball. It's this gray box. It's treated like freight, like literally it ships just like you see it on the screen there. That's, a, that's actually a Kindle on the top, um, which is, uh, has its shipping label information in it. And in a really creepy way, it can actually update that in flight, in transit, which is wild. But um, these boxes uh, had typically or traditionally been used, they're packed with hard drives, and they had traditionally been used to move data to or from a data center. So if you've got a whole bunch of data and you want to get it up to AWS, you order some snowballs, pump a bunch of data in them, and take it up. And likewise, you can exfil data if you wanted to uh, from the cloud back in the on-prem data centers. In 2016, they introduced this idea of a snowball edge. And what was different with the snowball edge was these now started to include compute capabilities. So it wasn't just storage, but now you had compute. Um, you have high bandwidth networking. They're, um, they're ruggedizable, they're clusterable, uh, or they're ruggedized, they're clusterable. They can handle dirty power. There's a whole bunch of great reasons to like these things. Um, and now they include compute capabilities. And the real like secret to this, or the, the, the clincher to this, is compute and storage are actually exposed just like any other AWS service. And so what that means is if you're using S3, if you're using EC2, that's exactly what it looks like on the box. It just shows up as another region. It just looks to you like another region that you can deploy into and take advantage of. So what that means is that we can take solutions that we have been building for the cloud and we can actually package them up and effectively put them on a cloud in the box and ship it out uh, into the environment. So if I go back to our data pipeline, we have our automated tooling piece is where I had stopped before where we spin up these ephemeral services and we poke them through the, to uh, poke a URL out to let people get to this. Well, now we can take that and we can actually provision and deploy a snowball edge. We know the time of interest. We know the area of interest. We know the data sources, sources. We know the stacks that the processing and tooling stacks that they're interested in. We can package all of this up, put this onto a snowball edge and deploy it out into the field. Once that's in the field, well, now what we have is this idea of an in-situ data loop. Now the teams have data, they can do a local Wi-Fi network, uh, they have storage capabilities, they have computing capabilities. We can now do local data collection on the field and incorporate that into the information we can make available. Um, it's still available to the tooling of their choice for the most part. If we can deploy it on there, we can, we can surface it through the tooling of their choice, but that information is available. And in a typical disaster response scenario, somebody goes in, so like say Verizon will go in um, or Army Corps or somebody will go in and deploy some kind of high bandwidth backhaul capability. It may not be there day one, but it will get there quickly. Uh, groups like ITDRC, the IT Response um, uh, Council is fantastic. They will deploy into these scenarios, build out infrastructure and make that available to first responders uh, as quickly as they can safely. So now if we have backhaul, high bandwidth backhaul to the cloud, we can exploit the whole horizontal scalability of the cloud and push all that data back and forth to the snowball uh, just over our area and time of interest. And so you know, dealing with kind of the potentially less bandwidth um, that we would have obviously um, outside of that response area. So we now have kind of the same set of applications buckets created on the snowball and static websites being delivered and deployed just like we would anything else um, along with additional processing and backhaul back and forth to, to the cloud. So this is a screenshot showing, um, again, this is Maxar imagery at the bottom, open street map at the top. And basically what you're seeing is I deliberately took the screenshot to show you what it looks like when it's chipped out, right? So this is a case where this is deployed onto the snowball edge. It's been chipped just over our area of interest. And then I scrolled up to basically show you what happens when you, you know, cross that area of interest. We just don't have, we have uh, open street map imagery, but we didn't have uh, Maxar imagery for that. All right, so. Where we are, we have horizontally scalable cloud processing doing all the heavy lifting to do processing of existing data sources in parallel. We're stuffing all of those into S3 buckets. We've got static content served up through another S3 bucket distributable to the world at scale, again, leveraging um, distribution capabilities out of the cloud. We can package that up into smaller version 
put it into a snowball edge and push it in the field. So how do we start collecting human in input? How do we start collecting you know, intelligence on the ground? Well, um, I don't know if anybody noticed it in the first time I went through the diagram, but I have this uh, Amazon Lex up here at the top of the diagram feeding that metadata DB. What we can do there is take advantage of a service <laughs> this sounds like an Amazon commercial. This really is not. It's just we're trying to exploit all of the capabilities we have available to us in AWS. There's a service called Amazon Connect, which is an elastic um, call center. And so what we can do is we can actually create a virtual call center, make that available, which gives us access to Lex um, and texting to and from this call center. You can also have actual humans answering at the other end. But um, Lex is the same uh, process or same technology stack that's behind uh, Alexa. So what we can do now is have two-way communications in and out of individuals. If people text information into this, we can parse it with Alexa and we can update that metadata DB. Likewise, we can push content back out through the metadata, through the, the disaster database. Um, but when that information comes in and populates the disaster response database, we can then create GeoJSON layer from that, push that out to the snowball and actually get that information out to people in the field. All right, now, geospatial data in the field. What's that look like? This is a screenshot uh, of a drone flight uh, over a boat ramp. Um, this was just flown by one of the team members. Um, it was a Phantom drone, um, commercially available, uh, and flown, brought back, and actually processed on the Snowball Edge, and then overlaid on top of OpenStreetMap. And you can get a sense of the, the difference in resolution by, you know, kind of there's the road on the right-hand side, obviously, from OpenStreetMap versus the resolution we're getting off of the actual drone flight. So to give you some context for this class of problem, there was an NGO we spoke with who was responding to um, a flood situation. Uh, it was in a conflict zone. Uh, when they came into the conflict zone to respond to this, um, they had some great, they had experience doing this and uh, they talked about kind of a, a mistrust uh, from the local people. Um, given it was a conflict area, uh, having people kind of drop in with maps saying, hey, you should go here, um, is, is a difficult um, social problem. And so the way they approach that is they actually tend to build the maps, they build this information in the field, and they will work with trusted people um, in, the, in the communities and bring them into this process. In addition, that lets them take advantage of data that they're collecting right then as, the, as best they can. Um, and what happens is after this map is produced, after this information is produced and made available to everybody, uh, there are local trusted individuals who can vouch for this map, who can say, yes, I was part of putting this together, like this is, this is trustable information, this is valid information. And so what they would do, they had two batteries, they would fly drone flights, um, they could do two 25 minute flights and collect information, they'd bring it back and they had one laptop, it was a gaming laptop, 64 gigs of RAM, and it would take uh, about two and a half days to process the 1800 images that comes off of those uh, two 25 minute flights. What that translates into is you've got a group in situ flying a drone that then has a two and a half day latency on their data. And that's just unacceptable. And so by pushing this into the field, by pushing these higher level compute capabilities, the higher uh, you can get up to hundred gigs of um, RAM on the uh, snowballs, the compute capabilities, you can get GPUs on the snowballs. We can bring that processing time way down and begin to process this. And this is all using open source. This is open street map. I'm sorry, um, open drone map is, the, is what we actually use to process this. But we can package up and deploy open drone map onto the snowball, put it in the field, and let them process there. Not just optical imagery, but we can also do things like digital surface models. So now when you process a digital surface model, what you're looking at here is elevation. The lighter colors are higher elevation, the darker blues are, are lower elevation. So in the event that that boathouse there, if that roof had collapsed, you'd be able to see it, particularly if we were capturing regular flight imagery. So what that turns into, it starts to beg the question around change detection, right? So change detection, what you can do, and again, this is using a hybrid model of pieces running on the cloud versus pieces running in the field. There are a lot of open data national assets that are available, Landsat, Sentinel. Um, then these are relatively coarse resolution uh, sources of data. They're sometimes measured in kilometers, but they're global coverage and continued repeat. Um, not necessarily high frequency repeat, but continued repeat. 
what you can do, the, the image you're seeing on the right is using this, um, this is uh, Peru looking at flood inundation um, using Sentinel-1 data to look at uh, for flood mapping. So what you can do is you can take advantage of this open data that's out there, freely available and readily accessible. And you can process this, you know your area of interest again, so you watch that area of interest and you start looking for changes in that, changes that are relevant to you, flood changes, um, deforestation, whatever particular type of issue you're looking for, um, vegetation change, drought, um, it's relatively easy to measure um, surface water, so you can look at you know lakes collapsing or streams or whatever the mudslides, things that are all visible from space. Um, you can look for those changes. What's uh, to then take that to the next level is commercial satellite providers, commercial remote sensing companies are making available taskable instruments. And so what that brings in is this idea of what's called tipping and queuing. So what you do is you use a coarse grained uh, remote sensing capability like Sentinel or Landsat, find your area of interest and then task, and that's the, that's the tipping piece, and then you, you task a high resolution frequent revisit rate from the commercial side, if you, you know, there's a cost piece in here, I understand that, but you can then task a commercial satellite to get high resolution, potentially down to the centimeter, um, resolution with rapid repeat rates over your area of interest. You can continue to do change detection there, you could do a drone flight, whatever the right way to get that high resolution piece is, but combining these two things together to get that rapid repeat. So, for example, Capella Space is eventually going to have 36 satellites up in orbit. They're looking for one hour revisit rates over this. So you could get high resolution, one hour repeat data without having to fly your own instruments passing over. So then the question becomes, how do you get this stuff down in the field, in situ? Well, no problem, you bring your own antenna. So none of what I'm talking about is like science fiction. This is not in the realm of like, hey, someday it would be cool. This is all doable right now. This is Tango. Tango is a Maxar product. Um, at the Hater is a humanitarian disaster response. This is a field deployable antenna you can bring down. <laughs> I personally have never set one of these up, but they claim it only takes an hour. But you can stand this up. And now if you can get an overpass uh, of the satellite, you can actually downlink into your snowball edge in the field. Because we can deploy the same stacks that we're doing in the cloud, you could then do the processing right there. All right. So. We now have the back end pieces, we have the front end pieces, like a, we have the, the cloud provided data sources, which are continuing to churn over a 5G link to get it in, in situ. We have human data, we have drone flights, we potentially have down link data. The question then becomes, how do you triage this, right? How, let's, let's pull this back to that knowledge question that I talked about in the beginning. How do you get, how do you turn this into knowledge? Well, here's where pulling in the space net piece we can start taking advantage of things like machine learning or triaging models on the edge. The Snowballs have GPU capability. You can get them compute optimized. You can get them with GPU, op GPU optimized versions. So take advantage of something like SageMaker Studio in the cloud, ideally prior to the event, train your model, and then deploy those out under the edge. We're in no way, I want to be real clear, you're in no way trying to replace the trained humans that are out there doing what they do. But instead, what you're trying to do is where to help them triage this additional information that's coming in to give them just what they need when they need it, when it's most relevant. Um, what you're seeing on the right hand side is a, a real simple model we trained for building detection. It's not perfect. Um, but uh, what you can, you know, this is just an example of a trained model, but you could be training for flooding, you'd be training for roof damage assessment. There's a whole variety of models you can use or you could train and build here um, to give you an idea of how it's done now. Um, there's a, uh, there's a, a, I'll say an app um, that in a disaster response scenario, um, a first responder will drive down the street and there's a simple app where they'll score 100% destroyed, 50% deployed, destroyed, you know, zero. And they just go building to building to building to building to just kind of catalog this. If we can do this at scale and we can do this with information, ideally detecting that this happened, high resolution overpass to get the imagery, do a rough triage. Now we can kind of begin to do like a heat map presentation of this of like here are the areas most affected and we need to begin getting human eyes looking in these areas. Again, there's, I, I don't want to in any way imply that we're replacing human pieces, but how do we automate and get them the knowledge that they can use as quickly as possible? So here's where we ended up, right? Something that looks like this. We can do 
multiple data sources. We can do in situ processing. Um, we can do this all using serverless to almost zero cost and then scale out to a scale that would be just unaffordable to maintain sitting idle in the corner um, when only needed for use. We can take advantage of human input from multiple sources using things like Lex to produce a, uh, the metadata we need to produce GeoJSON layers to give the basic, here's the red fire. We can look at wind data to say, here's where it's likely to go next. We can incorporate machine learning models to help triage this data. You can take advantage of drone processing this process in the field without having to wait uh, to get it back and bring it back in again, uh, potentially even with remote sensing overpass. And the whole idea, again, is that knowledge, getting that actionable knowledge into people's heads is key. And you get 15 minutes to do it. And that is my talk. I'm happy to take any questions, Gary, if there are any. Thanks. Um, I just posted in Slack to kick off the uh, the questions. I was curious uh, if you could talk about how long it takes to get one of the snowball edges if you order it. Oh, man, um, that really depends. Uh, so if you're ordering it for development purposes, so it, there's a bunch of factors that go into this. If you're ordering it for development purposes, um, it depends on the region you order from, and that's usually readily available. You can look and say, if I order it from US West, then it's going to take X amount of time. If you order it from US East, you get it faster, that kind of a thing. Um, compute optimized versus storage optimized versus GPU optimized changes all those things. Um, but it's usually on the order of several days to maybe two weeks kind of a thing. Um, now, separate from that, AWS has a disaster response group um, that uh, they will uh, keep, they have kind of their own pool of snowballs uh, that they can deploy with incredibly rapidly if they need to do that. Um, so that's not the same path you would take as a developer. All right, I see some people are typing now, so give people a <laughs> second to think yeah. there's a uh, lots of <laughs> lots of applause emojis too so it's uh all right thanks it's a little weird just talking to myself for 45 minutes That's yeah strange. maybe i, I should uh, everybody hanging in there i should clap for you for every time somebody posts one of these <laughs> it's all right <laughs> so if you're okay so a question if you're interested if someone's interested in this topic are there open source projects you would push people towards contributing to if they have some free time yeah, definitely. Um, it kind of depends on where your area of expertise is or where you're interested in getting involved. Um, if you're not, uh, if you're not on the development side, but want to be involved, OpenStreetMap is always looking for volunteers um, to help uh, update, maintain the imagery and update the catalog. Uh, if you are a developer, um, you can, uh, I would still encourage you to take a look at OpenStreetMap. Um, there's uh, actually Facebook has a bunch of machine learning pieces that they're involved in with um, with OpenStreetMap, basically helping to map areas, uh, basically similar to the SpaceNet challenge I talked about where um, you're trying to do road extraction. Facebook has a bunch of models where they will take high resolution imagery over areas that are generally underserved or not mapped, and they will make that available. Um, and they will process that, extract that, and make that available for OpenStreetMap usage. Uh, Open Drone Map is another fantastic piece of software. Uh, it is it is more complicated. You're you're getting kind of into the bowels of some of this stuff, but uh, it is really fantastic. Uh, from the front end side of things, um, Leaflet is a key component to all of this. Obviously, React is a piece in there. Um, we have a piece that we're going to be open sourcing called Fog, which is basically leveraging some of the visualization pieces into React and kind of configuring some of those pieces together. Uh, we'll make that available. Um, it really depends on the part. Uh, a lot of the data I showed, actually, I think all of the data I showed, except for the sphere imagery, all of the imagery I showed except for the sphere image uh, is open and publicly available. Um, and so um, hitting that, there's, there's plenty of uh, tooling around that um, that can always use help. Pangeo is a fantastic project uh, as well for image processing analysis or really kind of any scientific processing, but particularly remote sensing. Um, it's always looking for people to be involved. All right, I don't see, it uh, doesn't look like there's more questions coming in. So uh, okay. thanks, for, thanks for taking the time to speak. That was really interesting. My pleasure. Thanks everybody.